So, hi everybody. So I'm uh, Jem Williams, a curriculum leader for classics at a non-selective state school in Leeds. Um, so today I'm going to take you through some of the things that I have learned along the way uh, when introducing classical civilization. We introduced it five years ago and hopefully you will find some of these things very useful as you start out teaching classical civilizations at A-level. So I'm going to start off by um, how do you start out? How do you introduce students to the classical world? What knowledge do they need? What's the powerful knowledge? How do you build that knowledge very, very quickly? And although I know a lot of you will have just been in a modern scholarship session, we are going to put some of our focus back on the scholarship because I go to a huge amount of CPD and run a lot of CPD. And it's the one thing that just comes up time and time and time again is the modern scholarship. So although you might have heard some of it, if you're in the session before, hopefully some of my takes on how I get the students to engage with it, especially if they've never done any classical subjects before, which is the case for the majority of students that I get. Hopefully they'll be quite useful to you. We'll think a bit about the course, about how you structure it, about how you sequence it, where might they be retrieval opportunities and where should your priorities be? What are the big pitfalls of the course that you want to watch out for, but you also want to give your students a bit of a heads up about? So starting out strong, when you get a group of students who I've come to you, maybe some of them have done class of A-level, some of them haven't, people maybe have picked up dribs and drabs from somewhere. What is the powerful knowledge that those students need to give them a really good introduction to the classical world? Now, I've got up the course overview here. Hopefully, you know what units you're going to be studying, or you might have just started teaching them for the first time. But... I think regardless of what unit you're actually studying, the powerful knowledge in classics doesn't really change. So if I thought about, if I got students who had never done any classics before, what would I want them to know? Absolutely, I want them to know the gods and goddesses of Greece and Rome. I want them to know the Pantheon, not just their names, but what are their responsibilities? What's their iconography? We want at least some knowledge of mythology. Now, it's quite impossible just to ask them to know mythology. So what myths should they know? And the ones that I find myself explaining again and again and again are the judgment of Paris, the curse of the house of Atreus, so Agamemnon, Menelaus. I want them to know who Heracles is and who Theseus is. They seem to be the ones that just come up time and time again. Greek time periods. If they do know anything about ancient Greece, they probably just think ancient Greece is just one block of time that is ancient Greece. It's nice for you to be able to say to them about the Mycenaean age and them to have a placement of where that is in comparison to classical Athens. Bit about the geography, I, so you can say the Peloponnese and they know what you're talking about. And the idea of city-states, so that ancient Greece at this point is not a country, but we've got individual city-states and their different power and identities. A little bit about key religious practices, so libations and sacrifices. I found this quite important because especially when you're doing Homer, because as we know, World of the Hero is one of the compulsory units. There are lots of little references in there that just completely go over students' heads, like in the Odyssey. There's a reference to just like the fat of the fire burns. And without any form of background knowledge of how a sacrifice works, you don't understand that. And they're pouring libations constantly. So without any idea of what a libation is or its importance, again, all those lovely references are just completely going over students' heads. <laughs> the Trojan War, again, this is something I find myself just explaining again and again and again. Regardless of what you're studying, whether you're doing Iliad or Odyssey, whether you're doing Greek theatre, Greek religion, uh, Invention of the Barbarian, these same characters come up in all the units, Achilles, Agamemnon, who are they? 
and the early Roman history. So Aeneas, the foundation of Rome with Romulus and Remus, the monarchy and the establishment of the Republic. Now, you might not want to think at the very first weeks of year 12 that you're going to start with all this powerful knowledge all at once. For example, I start them with the gods and goddesses because I think that's the best point to start them with. And it's relatively simplistic. But your early history of Rome, you might not to do, want to do that powerful knowledge until you start teaching politics of the late Republic or imperial image. So although all of this is the starting point and that powerful knowledge, where you place it might be slightly different. <clears throat> so once you've identified what is this powerful knowledge, how, how do you do that? How do you build this knowledge incredibly quickly without you having to waste a huge amount of curriculum time that you want to spend on the specification? So there's a couple of the ways. This is one of the things that I do, first of all. I have this document and um, I'm more than happy to share this with you um, if you would like it. And it's preparation and pre-reading for if students want to do A-level classics. It is not compulsory. They don't have to do all of it. They can do one of it. They can do none of it. And I've put it together so that they can essentially choose things that will appeal to them. Do they want to watch YouTube clips? Do they want to watch a documentary? Do they want to read a book? Do they want to listen to a podcast? Now, you could put this just on your school website. If you happen to have GCSE students who you know are coming through to A-level, you could hand it out to them then. Um, but it's a good way if you have got very diligent students, I have to say, as much as I have produced this, it would be a handful of students who I know every year actually come in and they're like, I did this and I did that. Some of them just choose to have their summers. One really useful resource for A-level is actually the GCSE textbook for classical civilization. Because what we're doing here is we're plugging gaps of knowledge really quickly if students have not got any background knowledge of the classical world. So if you want them to understand how a sacrifice works without them reading a really heavy going A-level text, you can just say to them, read the two pages in the GCSE textbook that are about sacrifices or about how a temple works or about Greek theatre or about epic poetry. I don't teach the Greek theatre unit, but I've still had to tell my students about Greek theatre for various things that come up. So having a couple of GCSE textbooks that you can just put in your school library if you don't teach GCSE. So students have got access to them, a great way of just plugging some really powerful knowledge incredibly quickly. TED Ed is also brilliant, their education channel. They've got all of these beautiful YouTube videos on uh, myths and other parts of the classical world, like does Troy exist? Who are the Vestal Virgins? Again, brilliant ways to just plug that knowledge inc incredibly quickly. Again, the myth of Prometheus, brilliant for explaining what the origins of a sacrifice, why are we burning the entrails? And one of the things that I insist all of my year 12 students do in their first half term is I want them to read Mythos. There's a few reasons. Firstly, it's good to get them reading right from the get-go because there's just so much reading involved in the A-level. In Mythos, it's not just the mythology. You get all of these wonderful, subtle references to other bits of the classical world. It helps to link it to our modern world, but there's also a huge amount of vocabulary there that they're going to hear in context. That's going to help you when you start using that vocabulary in their classrooms. It's also a brilliant diagnostic tool because if students don't manage to read what is a very readable text. It helps you as a teacher identify where they might then maybe struggle when it comes to reading things like the epics or the poetry of uh, Ovid or Cicero, for example. And having very, very easy access to all of these things and the modern scholarship. 
<laughs> so in my department in the humanities area where we have a sick form workspace, we have bookcases that are dedicated to the geography, history and classics scholarship and books that we want students to read. So I have on there all of the scholarship that I use in the classroom, piles of the GCSE textbooks. Oxford Classical Dictionary is also very good for very quick references. If you're asking students to do reading outside of lessons, they're really good for them to be able to look something up that they don't quite understand. But another reason for having this space and bookcase is about really entrenching the students in this scholarship and that it's really at the heart of our A-level and they need to get used to reading these books, going to them for reference. So I also supply them with a reading list for their A-level modules as well. Again, you're welcome to have a copy of this. No, in no way do I think they're going to read all of these books. They're definitely not. But if they do want to go and read something, they know that this is where I'm directing them. This is what I have read in order to construct their A-level. And this is where all the scholarship that I'm going to use in lessons this is where it's all coming from so they can go and explore the books further themselves so all of these books freely available to the students but still that might be a bit too much for them being faced with these really massive chunky texts so another thing about starting off strong with your students is just recommending them what they should be reading so if they don't touch anything else at all of all of those books, and there are so many more books that I've got on Augustus, these are the two. These are the two that I want them to read. Ideally, I want them to read all of Eck. And with Zanka, I just want them to go in and out. I want them to read the bit about the Arapakis. I want them to read about the Sebastian. So really showing your students, this is what I recommend. These are our key scholars. So by starting out really strong at the beginning with the scholarship, I think you're opening yourself up to success and you're starting to really build that knowledge for the students. So coming on to the structure of the course then. So World of the Hero is obviously our compulsory unit. We have to choose the Iliad or the Odyssey. Or, and then we do Virgil's Aeneid. And then you've got your culture and the arts and then beliefs and ideas as well. There are a lot of questions and these are all really personal for you individually as schools about how you decide to structure it. And I thought of some key questions that I would ask myself if I was in a department where it was just me, which at the beginning of classical civilization a level at my school it was just me if you're a non-specialist if you're in quite a big department what kind of things might you consider and how do you construct this so one of the first things is about whether you do the iliad or the odyssey um again this i think this just is probably more about what you enjoy more which one appeals to you more as a teacher but also what might be useful later on for exploring some of your other units particularly Greek religion where Homer comes up quite a lot so think about which one of those I want to do do I want to do the Iliad or the Odyssey depending on what units you have chosen looking at the specification and thinking what needs to be taught first if I had chosen to do politics of the late republic from group three, an imperial image, I would probably be teaching politics of the late republic first, because chronologically that makes the most sense. And in imperial image, there is a lot of talk about the late republic and what happened and how Augustus creates his image around it. However, if you decided to do Greek religion and Greek theatre, you might want to explore Greek 
theatre first because Greek religion has got a lot of philosophy in it. It's quite a challenging unit. But which units are going in year 12 and which are going in year 13? That again might come down to whether you are a department of two, whether you're a department of one, whether there's more teachers and you want to split those units. Is there any knowledge that you're putting in the year 13 that's in the year 13 units that actually wants to be in the year 12 units? This might come with teaching it once through and thinking, maybe I should have put that a little bit earlier. So an example of this might be, so I'll tell you what my A level is first of all, and that'll help you with a bit of context. I do the Odyssey, which I do in year 12. I do the Aeneid in year 13. I do Imperial Image in year 12. So they're taught alongside each other, our Imperial Image and the Odyssey. So two lessons a week to Imperial Image, three lessons a week to the Odyssey. And then in year 13, we do the Aeneid and we do Greek religion. Now, my reason for doing that is part of the study of Virgil's Aeneid is looking at the historical context of the epic. So you're looking at its place within Augustan Rome. Now, if I'm teaching that in year 13 and in year 12, they've already studied imperial image. They know all about Augustus. They know about the image he created. And we've already had discussions about the place of the Aeneid within that then there is hundreds of references to Augustus and his imperial image and the empire and the students just completely understand them. So that works absolutely perfect for me. I also think that the Odyssey is slightly easier than the Aeneid. Iliads, again, I would still say that's easier than the Aeneid to read. So you find a lot of teachers tend to put Homer in year 12 and deal with Virgil in year 13, just because students have developed a lot more knowledge by then. There's also then the huge debate around the intertextuality of Homer and Virgil and about how much Virgil includes in the Aeneid that can be said to be a reference to the Odyssey. Just the opening lines of the Aeneid really express Virgil's intent that he wants to write a piece of epic poetry that is both like the Odyssey and the Iliad. So it makes sense to do Homer first when you're thinking of the structure of your course. Doing Homer first as well opens up loads of opportunities for you to, to talk about the gods and goddesses and the mythology as well. If you're doing Greek religion, this again is really important because there are so many references to the gods and Homer within the beliefs and ideas unit of Greek religion. It's also worth looking at the common elements that are across the course. So there are lots of things between group two and group three that come up in both of the units. So if you were studying Greek theatre from component two and Greek religion from component three, in Greek theatre, you would study Oedipus. And Oedipus starts with, or is a huge amount about, Tiresias, a prophet and an oracle and Delphi. In Greek religion, there is a study of Delphi and oracles. Now that opens up excellent opportunities for retrieval practice. As I've mentioned in Imperial Image, <coughs> politics and the late Republic, they go perfectly together. You're going to get lots of instances for retrieval practice there. Within Greek art, you would look at the Parthenon. Again, this comes up in Greek religion when you look at the Acropolis. You've also got in Greek art, you've got Achilles who appears in there as well. And See, you've got Achilles in the Iliad, so you might want to think about any crossover there. Invention of the Barbarian includes elements of Herodotus, which you would also study in Greek religion, and looking at the Temple of Athena Nike on the Acropolis <coughs> appears in the Invention of the Barbarian as well. If you're doing imperial image and love and relationships, in love and relationships, you would look at Ovid's Ars Amatoria, 
And we also look at that in Imperial Image as well. So if you're building your curriculum and you're looking at how you would structure the course, try find these common elements so that you can build in retrieval practice. But you also might consider jigging things around a little bit. For example, I mentioned a piece of really powerful knowledge being just knowledge of sacrifice and libations. If you were doing the Greek religion unit, it would be really good to actually maybe teach them the sacrifice lesson right at the beginning before they even start the Odyssey to give them that context. And then when you revisit it in year 13, it should really be retrieval practice rather than you introducing something that's completely brand new to them. So there are a lot of beautiful ways within the specification for you to consider about how you can do knowledge retrieval, build really strong, powerful knowledge, but also just structure a course really beautifully so that it's a progression model, that you can build knowledge upon knowledge rather than just thinking, I'm doing this unit, you're doing that unit. And if you've got different teachers teaching different units, it's good for you to know and to be able to tell them. Like I will be telling my teacher of Homer's Odyssey that when I teach Greek religion, I want them to know that Odysseus goes to Dodona. So when that reference comes up in Homer's Odyssey, I'm going to speak to that teacher and say, can you ensure that you really raise that to them? So when it comes up in Greek religion, it's something that we can talk about and I can reference the Odyssey, you can reference Greek religion. And that way, they're going to have so much better understanding of all of these things. So establishing your priorities and your pitfalls of the course. <coughs> now, these will be different for lots of different schools. It might be that your priority is around reading and understanding of the set texts. If you've got students who are slightly weaker with their reading, for example, or not doing homework or such. When I thought about what I see as the biggest pitfalls and what I absolutely put as my priorities and I make my students know these are the key priorities, it is 100% sources, so source material, and it is scholarship. So the reasons for this, there is a huge amount of source evidence and they are prescribed sources in the A-level. A lot of students are quite vague about the sources, either just talking about in the poetry or on an amphora or in coinage, we see this, when actually that, that's not enough. If you take the coin that's in the uh, top left-hand corner there, it isn't enough to just be able to say it's a denarius of Augustus. They need to know that this is a coin that was minted somewhere between 30 and 28 BC, post-Actium. It is a coin about peace, and you can see the goddess of peace there. They need to be able to identify that that relief sculpture is from the inner ionic frieze of the Parthenon, and it's showing an idyllic panathenate procession. Knowing that the amphora there is a panathenaic amphora, that depicts Athena, but also that it depicts her in the fourth century BC, which they can then compare to Hesiod and what he has to say about Athena in the seventh century BC. So the very specific knowledge of these sources, when they were produced, what they show, what they mean, that is a priority. And it's definitely a pitfall that students fall into. They're far too vague. And then the scholarship. By far, as I've mentioned, this is one of the areas where there's still a lot of conversation about how do we tackle the scholarship? What do the examiners even want with the scholarship? Now I'm going to approach this because obviously it's new to A-level about where do you start? How do you get students to do anything with it, to get them to understand it? And I've already mentioned a few things already about just completely engulfing them in this scholarship from the beginning. And one of the reasons why I put these as my priorities and my pitfalls, if we think about what 
each of the exams entail. Some of the exams for components two and three, there's knowledge based questions. And then there's a 10 mark source question. Then there's a second 10 mark source question. And the same in World of the Hero as well. They get the Gobbit questions. They get 10 mark questions, which is a section of the epic. Then they get 20 mark essay, so one 20 mark essay. And then they get one 30 mark essay. Now, obviously, the 10 mark questions, they are source based questions. They need to know the sources. And then if you look at what the mark schemes for the 20 mark and the 30 mark questions actually say, you've got your AO1, which is knowledge. Students are generally great at knowledge. And as teachers, our questioning and our retrieval practice is usually focused on knowledge, getting them to remember stuff. But where we look at where students actually get the big marks from the class of A level, it comes from AO2. And they say very similar things to the 20 and the 30 mark mark schemes. Now, one point of AO2 is about them being able to write relevant points. Their argument is logic, it's structured, that they can write a convincing argument and come to a judgment and a conclusion. I mean, no doubt that you're all very aware that at A level, writing an essay is a core thing that we do with all students. And they're probably going to be getting this from at least one of their other subjects as well about writing an essay. So when we think about it being really specific to classics, if you look at the points that I've put in red there, you can see for the 20 mark question, it says evaluation of the classical sources, that this is uh, perceptive, it is critical and that they can interpret and they can evaluate the classical sources. And then you go across to the 30 mark question and it says an identical thing about the sources. So points are very well supported by critical and perceptive analysis. They can interpret them, they can evaluate the sources and crucially for the 30 mark question, they can also do this with works of academics and any secondary sources as well. Now on the 30 marker, you can see AO2 is worth 20 marks. So when we think that the 10 mark question is gonna be source-based, then you've got your 20 mark question where 10 of the marks are coming from sources. Then you've got your 30 mark question where 20 of the marks are coming from sources and modern scholarship. The sources have to be a huge priority, but they are so overlooked by students and I think teachers quite often too, because we focus so much on knowledge. So I would say, crucially, ensure that sources are part of your retrieval work as well. So rather than just asking, what year was Julius Caesar assassinated? Put a picture of a coin up and say, what year was that coin minted? Or what event is shown on that coin? On this relief sculpture, what is shown there? What temple is that relief sculpture from? When is that temple dated from? These are absolutely critical things because to be able to put the sources in their context is then what allows the students to be able to analyze and interpret those particular sources. So, what do we do with them? Um, some of you may have just been in one of the sessions where they talked about looking at some of the visual material. If you are a non-specialist, one of the best departments you could go to for advice about dealing with sources is your history department. I spent six years as a history teacher, so it doesn't faze me in the slightest having to deal with the visual material because that's what historians do all the time they take their source evidence they're critical with it how do they get students in lessons to analyze it just like if you're not feeling particularly strong about doing the literature aspect of it like analyzing a piece of poetry go speak to your english department get some teaching strategies from them go speak to your religious studies department if you want some advice on about how to approach philosophy or philosophical debates because of the nature of our subject being multidisciplinary, it means that we have got all of these other subjects that we can reach out to and speak to. 
So making the source material a priority. I have a document that I ensure students do from the start of year 12 for each of their units. So the one you can see on the screen is the one for Imperial Image. So this is homework after pretty much every single lesson. Whenever a source has come up in lesson, they add it to their source sheets and it'll have different themes on there or <laughs> different styles of lessons. So is it about a relationship with Julius Caesar, such as here, or in our Greek religion one? Is it about a personal experience of the divine? They ensure that they put in what that source is, the date of it, and then some information. So the context of it and some analysis of it. So what was the message here that they hopefully wanted um, people to see? Or same when it comes to looking at um, the miracle inscriptions at the Asclepion. What was the point of those? Like, when were they created? What do they say? Which Asclepion is it at? Is it at Kos? Is it at Epidurus? These are all things we want students to know. And this is a great document for getting them to look back at the source material. And when it comes to <laughs> revising at the end of year 13, I always say to my students, if I was going to revise from one thing, it would be this document. This would be the thing that I would be knowing inside out because it's not just helping them learn the sources. It's helping them to actually just learn the knowledge as well of like the key events that happened and when they happened and about a temple and about the different myths and so forth. So that's a great way of getting students to ensure that source material is their priority. Now, the other huge one is scholarship. So getting students to engage with the scholarship. And for you as teachers, I'm not going to lie, there is no easy way around this other than you as a teacher just doing a lot of reading. There are people who, such as on the Classics Library, who have put together um, modern scholarship booklets where they take small extracts from the different articles and there's a variety of ways that you can do scholarship there is giving them a whole chapter of a book to read which I quite often do I do make them do that I think it's really important that they tackle a chapter of a book <laughs> apologies for my coughing I've got a bit of cold at the minute um, Sometimes it does warrant just giving them a quote in a lesson, something that's really punchy, really snappy, such as Mary Beard's um, Caesar was Octavian's passport to power. It's a great line that um, it says everything. We can talk about it loads. Sometimes it might just be a page from a book. Sometimes you as a teacher might have read an absolutely brilliant piece of modern scholarship but it, there's just no way that your A-level students are going to tackle that. So maybe you write a summary of it and you put forward, this is the academics argument. And I know teachers probably want, because we're very busy people, I know it's taken me years to read this much. In my first year of teaching A-level, I just ask people, what's, what's the one book that is absolutely golden? and for whatever unit you're doing, if you can reach out to someone, Classics Twitter is fantastic for that. Say, like, what's the one book that you would read? Like, for me, for, for if you doing Imperial Image, I would say read Eck. That would, that would be my one, which I just, I think is fantastic. But over time, over years of teaching it, hopefully you'll read more and more. And in order to teach the scholarship really well, you just need to know it really well as well. So, again, making this a priority. There's no point students doing all of this reading or looking at the scholarship if they're not doing anything with it. So again, this is another document that I make students do as the year goes on. So every time they read something, I want it added onto this. <laughs> now, partly that's because you don't want them doing this like at the end of year 12, because it would just be such a mammoth task. They would, they would never ever do it. So whenever they read anything, who's the scholar, 
what they're talking about, what theme does it fit into? What's the key argument? Because if they've read a five page article, they want to be able to very succinctly say, this is the point of view of that scholar. So what is their argument? Can they boil it down here to just a couple of sentences? Evaluation of it. Can they use their knowledge? Can they pull out some sources here, such as poetry, to actually talk about that opinion of the scholar? Because they definitely need to be able to do that. One of the key things they need to do on that 30 mark question is engage with the scholarship. They can't just tag it on and say, Galinsky says this. So Galinsky believes that Caesar had the Senate packed so full of support from the ruling class. Can't do that. They need to engage with it, which is then why I want to know, do they agree or disagree with it? What's their point of view about that piece of scholarship? As you can see, most of the time, they are in complete agreement with um, the scholar, although on this last one by Beard, only partial agreement. And then this is crucial as well, especially if these students want to get A's and A stars. Are there other pieces of scholarship which contradict that scholar or do they agree with one another? So they can add this in as and when they read other things and they think, oh, I read a piece of scholarship about the mausoleum. Zanka said that, which is different to what Mary Beard has to say. And then they can compare them. And then this makes deploying the scholarship in the exam even easier. So rather than just saying, this is what William states, we want to get the students to engage with it. Is that scholar correct? So good answers. We will see the students engage with the scholarship. The best answers will see multiple scholars who support one another. And the very, very best arguments are going to have two scholars who have opposing viewpoints and then the student is going to be able to analyze that and with the source evidence say this is what I think this is what I think about this crucial piece of evidence so because this is what the examiners want and this is what needs to be done in the 30 mark questions to really engage with the scholarship we need the students to be really engaging with it in the lessons. Um, just a few other tips on scholarship, because um, some students reading is not, I, I know a lot of students struggle with the scholarship to read it. Masselet is an absolute wonder when it comes to doing scholarship because all of the lectures are around 10 minutes long. It's an alternative to reading. They're really easy to put in lessons. They're really easy to set as homework. Um, and again, getting students to engage with it. I ensure that students write a detailed set of notes for every Masalit lecture that they write. So again, they've got it as part of the scholarship. Only drawback to Masalit is that it's crazy expensive. However, I do know if you, you correct me if I'm wrong on this, if you got started a classical subject this September, you can have a year of Masalit for free. Yeah, it's the uh, Classics for All uh, funding that with Chris yeah. from Masalit. So if you're brand new, get in touch with the CFA and that'll sort of help you out with that. I will say, though, um, I have built pretty much my whole curriculum around the Maslit lectures embedded within it. So I do now have to pay for Maslit forever and it is expensive. But as much as that is quite annoying, it is great. And for us, a scholarship and what we need, it is an absolute wonder. The other thing that is absolutely fabulous are the omnibus articles. They're free. They are really short PDFs. They're usually just uh, two sides of A4. And there are so many topics. There's a full um, archive and catalogue of links there that you can look on. And these are just brilliant for scholarship. The students love them because they're just overjoyed that it is a sheet of paper and there isn't a staple in the corner with all of the other pages because it's a chapter of a book I'm making them read. But I think mix it up, give them the short, snippy little gobbets, 
give them the whole book to the chapter. Can they tackle it? Can they do it? Give them the nice omnibus articles. Give them the Massa Lit Lectures to watch. The other great thing about the Massa Lit Lectures, again, is just hearing that language and the students then being able to use it, hearing that vocabulary, they can use it much better in their essays. Um, so again, you're getting them to do all this reading. So what do you actually do about it in the lessons? And for you, again, it depends on your school and your context. Do you want them to read it at home? Do you want to read it in class with them? Obviously, if you're doing it in class, it really eats into the time that you've got to actually cover the spec and the knowledge. If you are getting them to do it at home, think about that structured support they would need. Have you modeled to them actually how you annotate a piece of scholarship so the students just don't highlight the entire book chapter because it's all really important? This is one example, it's based loosely on Cornell note taking, where you can get students to give chapters, um, to give paragraphs within chapters titles. What questions do they have to ask? What would they say to this scholar? Um, one of my top tips for you would be, because remembering all of this scholarship and who has said what is massive, get them to learn a who's who. So who are the authorities in the different areas? So if I said to them, who are your authorities in imperial image? I want them to be able to say that it is Eck, it's Zanka, it's Wallace Hadrill, it's Beard. If I ask them about it for Greek religion, I want them to be able to say it's Burke, it's Idenau, it's Souvenir Inwood. But again, that isn't enough. What are they authorities in within that area? Because a lot of the time students can remember pieces of scholarship, but they can't remember who said them. So they might be able to remember a person who argued um, about the northeast corner of, of the forum being a bit wonky, but they don't know who said that and why they said that. But if they know that Eck tends to write about history and biography of Augustus, whereas Zanka writes about the imperial image and scrutinizes the sources, that might lead them in the right direction. The same when you're thinking about any of the units. So if you think about Greek religion, I know that Ida now writes about polis religion or certainly everything I've ever given my students. So if they can remember some scholarship about polis religion, then hopefully they should be able to know, oh, right, it must be Ida now. She's the one that we read about that. Bit more complex when you get to the epic and world of the hero than when you've got people like Jenkins and Griffey who are writing about both of the epics. But even so, getting them to know a who's who, do your retrieval practice and your questioning on lesson, do it on the scholarship as well. So who said this? What is the point that Williams makes about book six of the Aeneid? Add that retrieval practice in, make sure they know this scholarship really well. Um, so I will open it up there to any um, questions um, that you might have, or particularly anything that I just haven't covered or spoken about at all. Feel free to unmute rather than use the chat function if you'd like. Yep. Yeah. Oh. They say questions. <laughs> Thematic would always be the way that um, I approach them. Um, so to completely avoid storytelling in any way, especially when it comes to the Odyssey, and it allows them to approach the essays in such a more fluid way. So, of course, getting them to plan them is absolutely key. It's the scholarship, that's the difference between, between the two. So obviously it's a length, it's the amount of time that they spend on them. The 20 mark end essay is essentially, it's a shorter version of the 30 marker, but minus the scholarship. And they get absolutely zero marks for putting scholarship into their 20 mark essays. I have seen students try to shoehorn it in um, because they're like, oh, I know a bit of scholarship that goes with this. It's not worth it. So just tell them, don't, do not do it. Don't put the scholarship into the 20 markers. 
Um, they will also just be much narrower in their scope. So, for example, in World of the Hero, the 20 marker is more likely to ask you about a specific section of books. So it might ask you just about um, Odysseus's um, adventure books, whereas a 30 marker would ask you for massive scope, like it's whole epic um, level. Um, or for component to a theme that runs across the entire chronology. So the 20 markers, much more narrower in their scope, much more specific, no need for any scholarship, and they're just a bit shorter, but just get students to ensure that they're doing them thematically and that they've got that source evidence in there. Not just one source, but as many sources as they think is necessary from a range as well, not just writing about poetry, or coinage um, or a relief sculpture, let's bring in as much as possible. Um, yes, so do you get them to value, to compare the scholars within the essay? Yes, so which one they think is more convincing. So if I just take you back to, um, oh, I've lost it now. Ah, this. What's their piece? What's their opinion on it? So do they agree or disagree? And are there scholars who disagree with one another or um, agree with one another? And I would say, so this bit of advice here um, came from a CPD session I attended with one of the top examiners who trained people. And he said that the very best arguments had scholars with opposing viewpoints where the students then engaged with that and said which one they thought was the more convincing. Who knows the answer to this question? How many scholars would you use? Um, a caveat here, there, there has been a lot of debate around the use of scholarship and there has been different answers from different sources around exactly how many scholars that they want and even whether you can address school of thought versus knowing the actual names of the scholars. As a rule of thumb, I want a scholar a paragraph. So if they're writing um, a thematic essay about... Augustus's Imperator, I want a piece of scholarship in there about that, and it's ideally a, a green or opposing pieces. So I think if you go for a scholar kind of per point, but I say, please don't take that as a um, gospel because there is so much conflicting arguments about the scholarship. The only thing I can definitely say is from looking at this year's results, um, one of my students got 29 out of 30, so I'm, I'm confident with how um, they approach the scholarship in my classroom. But it's a very difficult one to give a concrete answer on, I'm afraid. This was something that we were just discussing in the, the first session. Um, and it seems that a lot of schools are suggesting sort of at least two to three as sort of like a safe number within an essay. Um, and I think one of the people who also attended the session said that she'd been on a OCR training course and had word from a, an OCR trainer that two to three is is a suitable number to be looking uh, looking at. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, because otherwise as well, the amount of, if you think about the amount of questions that could be asked on an exam year, and then you want a piece of two or three pieces of scholarship about everything they could possibly ask. It's a lot. It's a huge amount of scholarship. And it's definitely something that I know teachers are kind of a bit disgruntled about. Um, as I say, I'd never heard um, about the comparison either. I, I can't remember where the training was at all that I attended for this but the person running it was a very senior examiner and I think this slide is actually um very very similar to the one that he showed us um about what makes a really good answer and so all I said I can't say to you 
this is exactly what OCR want. This is exactly what the examiners want. I, over the last five years, have attended masses of amounts of training from official OCR training to examiner training to just teachers running it. Everyone has said a totally different thing about the scholarship. This, as you said, it, it, it makes complete sense. It's what students would consider um, at degree level, which the classics A level is really similar to in, in terms of its rigor, that it makes sense to look at opposing arguments, to look at scholars that say different things. And if you're going to engage with scholarship in a really positive way, then you want to wrestle with it and you want to be able to say, well, these are two completely different ways of looking at it. Um, yeah, exactly. It, it does make more sense. Which one is more convincing? Um, I'll just, I didn't have time to show you this, but I'll just pop it up so you can have a look at it. This is one of the activities that I gave students to do to get them um, to look at sources and scholarship together about putting them into a convincing argument. And it was on this top and northeast corner of the Forum of Augustus, where you can see it's cut away. It's a bit wonky when Roman architecture is famously incredibly symmetrical in its beauty. And there's a huge amount of debate about that top corner of the Forum, about why, why it's wonky. So we started with the source evidence, where you've got a piece of Steutonius, who is saying that there were people living there who didn't want to move, and Augustus didn't want to evict them and Augustus himself saying that like, you know I purchased this land from my own from my own pocket it was my money I didn't evict these people and then you've got four pieces of scholarship and four people who say wildly different things about this corner of the forum um, and one of the greatest ones is this one by M. Um, Cockle here who just says it's got absolutely nothing to do with the reasons in Stutonius he claims that the forum was limited by the surrounding streets that there was a sewer below the streets so they quite simply couldn't build there but then you've got Delfino saying that they were limited by the local uh, topography that it taken them so long to excavate and level the south end of the forum that they just didn't have the time or the money to spend on the north end so they just cut around it and this is was a great activity to simply say to the students who agrees with who who disagrees with who um who do you think is more convincing there looking at it do you think that you know Augustus was just saying oh yeah look at me like I, I didn't evict these people um look you know, at how much of a father of the people that I am and how much I sacrificed this own grand um, <clears throat> piece of architecture he was building to promote himself to allow them to stay in their houses. And then people who are geologists coming into it and saying, no, it's the topography, not at all. Stutonius is lying. And what a great piece of evidence to show that Stutonius here is actually inflating Augustus a little bit. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Oh, 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 was this such gossip that everyone believed it, including Stutonius? It's brilliant. <laughs> oh, sorry, voice is going now. So, Doing activities like this are really brilliant to show students how to engage with the scholarship as well as the sources. Do we have any other further questions or comments? Nothing. It is now 12 minutes past six, so I imagine you're all sort of waiting for <laughs> waiting for your dinners, perhaps. Um, I, Gem, I'd like to say a massive thank you. I thought that was absolutely brilliant and so comprehensive, everything that you covered there. Um, and hopefully those of you that are on the call that are new to teaching A-level have been able to take something away from that. Um, if you don't have any questions now, but you think of something later on, then obviously uh, Gem's left her email address there but you can also ping me an email and I can forward it on um, likewise the recording will be made available as soon as I can get it uploaded to YouTube and I will send around Gemma if you're happy for me to send around the PowerPoint I'll do that 
as well. Fab. Um, yeah, that's fine. Well, thank you. Um, and if any of you have any um, any thoughts on future Teach Me's, any sessions that you'd like some support with, then do just drop me a line and we can look to organise those in the near future. Um, but for now, I'm going to stop the recording um, and then that's that's us for this evening. So thank you for joining us. Um, I hope it's been a really useful afternoon for you.